guys, gals, and non-binary pals, welcome to the Alexandrian. If this is your first time here, I am Justin Alexander. I am looking forward to diving into our, our adventure this evening. We are going to be continuing our series of looking inside the very first edition of Dungeons and Dragons that was ever published. In 1974, designed by Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, Dungeons and Dragons was published as a boxed set with three books inside it by Tactical Studies Rules Incorporated, what would later become known as TSR. Tonight, we are going to be taking a look at the second of those booklets, the book which is called Monster and Treasure. We can see our illustration of a beautiful dragon on the, uh, the front cover of the book here. So as we discussed with the previous volume and also the cover of the box as we just saw a couple minutes ago, you'll see that this game is labeled, of course, Dungeons and Dragons, but it is rules for fantastic medieval war game campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. And as we've talked about before, the notable thing here is that it is not described as a role-playing game. And in fact, you will not find the words role-playing game anywhere in the original D&D boxed set. The term hadn't been invented yet because there was only one game that could even have been described as a role-playing game, per se, at least in the modern sense of the term, at this time. And as a result, people didn't have a need for it, and they hadn't really quite figured out exactly what the role-playing game was going to be. I think that Arneson and Gygax and their players knew that they had something special and unique with Dungeons and Dragons, but I don't know that they necessarily really had their thumb on exactly what made it unique. And one of the interesting things looking at some of the early games produced in 74, 75, 76, that time frame, is a number of games all kind of trying to come to grips with what this new form of game was and what it meant. But as you can see here, it's still very much perceived as being part of the War Games fandom and part of the War Games community. So our first page, just inside the front cover here, is a note that inquiries regarding rules should be accompanied by a stamped return envelope and sent to Tactical Studies Rules at 542 Sage Street, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, 53147. And I believe, uh, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I believe that that is in fact Gary Gygax's basically home address. At this time, TSR was essentially operating out of his garage. Dungeons & Dragons Volume 2 by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, copyright 1974. And here we have our second piece of art in Monsters & Treasure. This one of some sort of, I, I, I'm assuming, undead knight astride a horse with no saddle, armed with a sword and a chain shirt. All right, next page up here is, uh, is our table of contents, which is labeled an index, and we can kind of see... If you compare this to the, the index or table of contents from the first book, we can see that there are fewer topics to be covered in this book. That is, of course, because most of this is going to be a listing of monsters and treasure. But we have a monster and reference table on page 3, which we'll see in just a moment. The monster descriptions start on page 5 and last until page 23, where we have magic slash maps determination table. We then have an explanation of magic items, uh, a table for magical item saving throws, and then treasure begins on page 39. The one thing I think that's interesting to call out on this page is the fact that maps are specifically called out here as being of equal importance to magic, and in some ways of equal importance to monsters as well. You have monsters, and then you have magic and maps, and those two things are kind of seen as either part of the same thing, or at the very least, on equal footing with each other. And I think that's really interesting. We'll kind of take a peek at, at those mechanics of, of the mechanics that are presented for those maps when we get to that section of the book, and, and kind of see uh, how those work and how that informed the uh, the assumed style of play that had evolved out of Dave Arneson's Blackmoor campaign at this point. So yeah, so on page three here, we do in fact have the monsters reference table, which includes hostile and benign creatures. Special characteristics are dealt with in the separate paragraphs pertaining to each monster which follow uh, this table. And here you have just uh, obviously a list of, of all the monsters we're going to be taking a look at. Here. We have monster type, and then we have the number appearing. And we can see that some of those numbers, in fact, most of these numbers are in fact uh, very large. There is a footnote there uh, off of number appearing, which reads referees option, increase or decrease according to the party concerned, used primarily only for outdoor encounters. And so you can see, for example, if you're rolling up a random encounter with Min, uh, apparently the number appearing for Min is anywhere from 30 to 300, probably rolled as 1d10 times 30. 
that number is a little bit difficult to kind of, of wrap a head around. Uh, we do have some that seem a, a bit more reasonable, although even like one to six basilisks, like six basilisks seem like a lot of basilisks to come after you. Uh, Holic maybe wants to ask, so uh, these numbers are like to populate a hex, not an encounter. Yes, that would be my read on it. This is actually never explicitly said, but the footnote there about the number of pairing being used primarily only for outdoor encounters rather strongly suggests that. So one thing to understand about the sort of assumed style of play at this time is that uh, in modern terminology, we refer to as kind of tiers of play, and there were kind of three tiers of play. They weren't well defined in this sense, but they kind of operated like this. And at the first tier of play, the assumed form of play was to journey into the dungeon. And I say the dungeon rather than a dungeon, because for a good long while, that was the assumption that there was one dungeon. There was the dungeon beneath Castle Blackmoor or the dungeon beneath Castle Greyhawk, and you would go into that dungeon. And only later did they begin developing the idea that there could be other dungeons. Uh, one of the reasons that idea began to emerge initially was because other people started GMing the game, sometimes in a shared campaign world where characters could travel from one DM's campaign to another, or one DM's table to another. Uh, and each of those DMs would have their own mega dungeon that shared the world, most of them taking the form of dungeons beneath a castle. And partly the reason for that is, again, they were still struggling. They kind of come to grips with what this new game was. And one of the things they knew about the game was what Dave Arneson had done for his initial sessions, which is that there was a castle called Castle Blackmoor, and there was a dungeon underneath Castle Blackmoor that went down level by level into the dark depths of the world. And so when other people began running the game, the way to run the game was to create a castle and have a dungeon underneath it and to go into that dungeon. And the variety was simply what the map of that dungeon was and what you stock that dungeon with in terms of creatures and so forth and the lore developed from there. So that was kind of the first tier of play back then was at low levels you would be going into that dungeon and exploring that dungeon. Later when you were higher levels you would go out into the wilderness and begin exploring the wilderness. And the challenges in the wilderness were, were larger and more complicated and often more dangerous than the ones in the dungeon, at least the upper levels of the dungeon. And that may feel strange until you realize that this was all an emergent style of play. Dave Arneson didn't sit down and have the entirety of Dungeons and Dragons spring full-blown from his brow. He created a dungeon and had the players go into it. And later the players and Dave Arneson asked, well, what, what else could we be doing? How can we go out and explore the rest of this world? And at that point they were higher level. And so when they went out to explore the rest of the world, Dave Arneson was designing material for higher level characters. And that informed the design decisions of what adventuring in the world meant. And that is kind of when we start looking at these kinds of number appearings where you were basically like uh, Harlequin 81 was saying, you are generating uh, a whole hex or a whole adventure of play. I actually have an article on the Alexandrian that looks at this specifically in the case of men and specifically in the case of bandits and shows how you can use the guidelines here to very quickly gin up not an encounter, but really an entire adventure starring the band of men or the band of basilisks that you end up generating. Polyquin 81 mentions the whole dungeons under that are under the castle thing is neat because if I recall correctly, there are some guidelines later about who rules castles and how they respond to approaching adventurers. Yes, there are. And in fact, that becomes kind of begins to touch on the third tier of play. And that third tier of play is when the characters level up enough to actually begin taking over the wilderness and founding their own baronies and later kingdoms and becoming rulers and controllers of the land. So you have those three tiers, dungeon adventures, wilderness exploration, and then basically taming the wilderness. And you have to understand that that was kind of the structure of play. I use structure here a little bit loosely, but this was basically the structure of play. And I say loosely because it was all still so experimental. And a lot of the content that we're going to see in terms of creatures and treasure and all of that has to be understood within that specific context of what sort of the assumed method of play was going to be, or the assumed form of play was going to be. Next up, we have armor class. That seems pretty straightforward. We then have move in inches, which again has a footnote. And that footnote is number after slash is flying speed. Creature may charge also and get bonus to normal move. That'll be defined later. We then also have hit dice as a column. That's been previously defined. That's going to be a D6 with the plus, with the plus being just an additional number of hit points. So two plus two means roll two D6 plus two hit points 
for example. And then we have, of course, the infamous uh, percent in layer column, which is actually just a typo or misspelling of percent in layer. And so the percent in layer is intended to be the likelihood that if you roll the encounter, that it is in fact a layer encounter, or conversely, if the PCs discover the monster's layer, this can also be the percentage chance that they are actually in their layer at that moment. The interesting thing about percent in layer, though, is that there actually were a number of dungeon masters who interpreted this as literally a statement of how likely a, a given creature was to lie to the PCs during a conversation with them. We then have type or amount of treasure. Uh, I don't actually think, is there an amount in here? Okay, there is a couple of amounts under ogres and, and giants. Well, even those have types. Newer players may not be aware of the older type method of treasure. And we'll kind of dive into this a bit more when we get to the treasure section of this book. But this is actually something I miss quite a bit. Basically, each one of these treasure types has a different table that you roll on to generate the amount of treasure. And so having different treasure types gave you a really quick and easy way of varying the types of treasure that would be given by different monsters, giving you both a simulationist tool in the sense that ogres should have a different type of treasure or a different mix of treasure than, say, an ochre jelly, but also a gamist one in which you could balance the types of awards across many different types of creatures. A couple other things to kind of call out here that are interesting. I'm not going to read through every entry on this table, probably because we'll be diving into every one of these monsters later. But let's, for example, start off by taking a peek at the Hydra on this page. And I love that that the number appearing for Hydras is instead the number of heads that the individual Hydra will have. You can also see that lycanthropes have a, a variable armor class, moving inches and hit dice. It's going to be described in the individual paragraph. Dragons and lycanthropes both have a footnote, which says, see separate paragraphs regarding each monster for various possibilities. What they're calling out there is that there are multiple types of dragons and obviously multiple types of lycanthropes as well. Sea monsters, all variable and at the referee's discretion, basically what they're doing there is, boy, we really didn't have enough room for sea monsters. Sorry about that. In quite a few places, you will see on the number appearing here, you'll see just a slash out, basically. Generally speaking, what that means is they aren't going to show up just sort of randomly, and they aren't going to show up in outdoor encounters, or and or they aren't going to show up in outdoor encounters. So the book includes stats for horses, but you're not going to just encounter horses randomly in the wild. Obviously, you probably could, but in this case, no. And also, similarly, like the Jin and the Frit are going to be bound. Invisible stalkers are the result of spells being cast. They aren't going to be encountered separate from that, is, I, is, is my interpretation of what all of that means. Iconoplast mentions that they like that this table is hostile and benign creatures, but as far as I know, leaves it to the DM to figure out which is which. Largely true, and also that would be highly contextual. If you think back to the first volume here, this Men and Magic's volume, uh, there is this page here where they talk about character alignment and the fact that in D&D &D there's a team lawful and a team chaos and neutral in between, and players are expected to pick one of those teams for their character. And you can see here the list of which alignment each of those characters are with. And when you combine this list from volume one of which team do these creatures belong to with the list of benign and hostile creatures, the alignment depends on the alignment of the characters that they are that they are joining. The one thing you may notice about the, the list of creatures on this table is that they are not in any particular order. They just kind of exist. In some cases, things that are similar are kind of grouped together, but this can be something of an illusion often. Like the one exception is you can see all the undead are together. You've got the skeletons, the ghouls, the whites, the wraiths, the mummies, and the specters, and the vampires all kind of grouped together. But if there's a logic to the rest of it, it kind of it, it is kind of all over the place. And for better or for worse, the order that you see on the page here is the order, more or less, that the monsters will go, are going to appear in the text as we move forward into that text. So speaking from experience running this game, trying to find a monster description, or even necessarily their entry on the stat table here, can be quite difficult. Uh, the other thing to kind of note, too, is although there is separate paragraphs detailing additional abilities for these creatures, most of what you need, and in many cases all that you need to run many of these creatures, is on this table. This is basically 
um, all the stat blocks in the book. And if we page ahead a little bit and take a peek at the min one, it's quite large. But if you take a look at the skeleton slash zombies entry here, for example, you can see that there are no mechanical stats there. If you're running a skeleton slash zombie, you are just going to be looking at this table here and looking at their armor class, their move, their hit dice. Those are going to give you all the information, mechanical information you need to run creatures in OD&D. &D. In terms of the actual sort of mechanical load for creating and running a creature, it was quite light and therefore quite easy to put on a single table table like this. There are some real advantages to this, just obviously less mechanical load. But the cool thing about having everything on a table like this is I will actually just print out these two pages and I'll put them on my GM screen. And then I will actually just have 90 to 100 percent of the information I need for any given creature literally at my fingertips as I'm running the game. Super easy, super convenient. Iconoplast mentions it's amazing to see what difference the move from typewriters to word processing made for RPGs. Monsters are no longer ordered in the order we happen to think of them. Vorfaxer has, has cleverly intuited a method in the madness I had not previously noticed, which is that cockatrices, basilisks, medusae, and gorgons are all grouped together, and these are all things that turn you to stone. So you have undead, things that turn you to stone. Possibly the next section is things inspired by Greek mythology. Like I say, it gets a little bit vague, but there we are. So we turn the page one more time, and we are now, uh, I guess we have a little bit more general information. Uh, it says special ability functions are generally as indicated in chainmail. We're not contradictory to the information stated here and after, and it is generally true that any monster or man can see in total darkness as far as the dungeons are concerned, save for player characters. Chainmail was a war game that had been designed by Jeff Perrin and then expanded by Gary Gygax. Next up here we have attack slash defense capabilities. Versus normal men, uh, attack versus slash defense capabilities versus normal men are simply a matter of allowing one roll as a man type for every hit die, with any bonuses being given to only one of the attacks, i.e. a troll would attack six times, once with a plus three added to the die roll. Combat is detailed in volume three. If we take a look at uh, the troll, you can see that the troll has six plus three hit dice. And we talked about the fact that they would have 66 plus three hit dice. But what this paragraph is saying is that supposedly the troll, because they have six hit dice, would make six attack rolls, of which the first one would get a plus three. And it says combat is detailed in volume three. Well, the de combat being detailed in volume three is, is a little bit shaky and a little bit iffy. Uh, there's not actually a lot of detail about man-to-man -man combat in volume three of the rules, as we'll eventually see. The other thing you quickly realize is that this, this idea that the troll gets to attack six times, and by extension, say a manticore gets to attack six times, a hydra gets to attack 12 times with 12 heads, gets to attack 12 times on its turn, and so forth. The only way I can put that is if you actually put that into play using the rest of the rules of the game, you just, it, it's completely, it's completely unbalanced. Because if you, if you recall the way that hit points work, there is no, there's really no constitution bonus to hit points to speak of for the most part. So most players are limited to at best maybe 1d6 plus 1 hit points per level. And so the idea Idea that, that you can basically get into a fight with something and it can hit you six times is just devastating to a degree that I would describe as, as literally unplayable. It should also be mentioned that this idea is, is not found consistently throughout the OD&D rules. There have been many attempts over the years, and I'm sure there were in the 70s themselves, to try to figure out how to apply this rule to the game. It's not clear that there is actually a solution that works. The best explanation that I have seen for the intention of this passage is that it really is a holdover from Chainmail being a war game rather than a role-playing game, that large, powerful creatures like trolls and dragons, in order to represent their effectiveness on the battlefield, the extra attacks make sense in that context when you don't particularly actually care about any of the individual soldiers in the opposing force. My guess is that that the vast majority of OD&D DMs have, have never used this particular rule. And there'll be other examples of that. All right, now we're into the actual monster descriptions. First up, we have men. And there are several categories of men. And we're going to look at each of these categories as a subtype. So first up, we have bandits. Although bandits are normal men, they will have leaders who are super normal fighters, magical types, or clerical types. For every 30 bandits, there will be one fourth level fighting man. For every 50 bandits, there will be in addition one 
fifth or sixth level fighter. Uh, you roll a d6 on a one to three, they're fifth level. On four to six, they're sixth level. And for every hundred bandits, there will be in addition one eighth or ninth level fighter. Again, roll the die and get the eighth or the ninth result, 50-50. If there are over 200 bandits, there will be a 50% chance for a magic user. Again, there's a die roll to determine their level and a 25% chance for a cleric of the eighth level. If there are exactly 300 bandits, there will absolutely be a magic user and the chance for a cleric goes up to 50%. There is also a chance that there will be magical accoutrements with the super normal types. And then there's a table here showing that for each level of fighting man, there's a 5% chance roll separately for each of armor, shield, sword. Same thing for magic users on wand slash staves, rings, and miscellaneous magic. Clerics for miscellaneous weapons, armor, and shield. They do know that if an edged weapon is indicated by roll, go to the wand staff table and roll again. But if result is not usable by cleric, then there is no item in this category as a result. And then we have a little cute illustration of a purple worm. There's a couple of articles I wrote about an organization called the Blood Shield Band. Bandits. The uh, the story on those is basically looking at this specific paragraph as an example of the methodology behind how OD&D's monster book works. And you can really see it really clearly here with the bandits that this is a that this is a procedural generator that is designed to generate an entire population. And from that, adventure is going to emerge. Uh, and you can see this idea of generation as a spur for creation throughout the OD&D rules. If we go back to the first book, Men and Magic, and we look at how character creation worked, it's described as generating a character. You started by rolling your 3d6 in order down the list of six ability scores to determine what your ability scores were. And when you did that, you were not really creating a character in that moment, you were generating a character. You were discovering a person in the game world that you would now be playing. And then there were creative decisions that were built on top of that, and oftentimes prompted by that initial sort of improv C that the procedural content generator generated. But the initial step was let's get let's get a random improv seed to improvise with and we can see the same process here where you say okay well i want to have a bandit group and right here you can you can roll you can use the number of pairing table to roll the number of of people who are going to show up and then once you've done that you can generate like how powerful is their leader what does his lieutenants look like does he have a magician assisting him does he have a cleric working with him i.e just how much does this look like robin hood and and so you take all of that at the end of it you have a bunch of information that then can spur your creative decisions as a dungeon master so the worm mentions that regarding the multiple hits rule that we were talking about in terms of trolls having the uh, the six attacks he mentions that the usual interpretation they've seen is that it only applies when fighting one hit dice figures. He also mentions that fighting men characters, PCs, were also interpreted to be able to do that, to attack a number of times equal to the, either their hit dice or their level. KK Moore asked, would you be rolling all this during the game or as prep? Drow007 says during the game. I think both, they're, they're there for both purposes. I have used these rules when initially doing my seed of a hex crawl. But once you get a feel for how these things flow, you can actually generate pretty quickly here. This really boils down to grabbing a couple handfuls of dice rolling them out and then interpreting the results like a fortune teller reading the bones basically. Omen Owl mentions that the wargaming aspect for characters where a model is relatively disposable. I think that's something that you have to understand about the evolution of the game is how characters evolve from being very disposable to not being disposable at all in terms of player characters. There's actually a story about one of Dave Arneson's original players who came to either the first or an early session of Blackmore, and they were using a very primitive set of rules where hit points didn't exist yet. Uh, this would be like one of the very earliest sessions. And so if you got hit in combat, you died the same way that you would in a typical war game. And this was not terribly satisfying as a player. If you have your one character that you control and every time you get hit you die that was no satisfying experience it's got a terrible time and he said this game sucks it's never going to amount to anything and he left and for years he refused to come back and play dave arneson's response to that was to develop hit points for the first time which is now so ubiquitous it's found everywhere not just in role-playing games but everywhere as a mechanic so that characters would have less disposability in that moment the playtest experience that is always an, is an interesting 
point of empathy I have in that story. I remember when I was first figuring out how to run a hex crawl over a decade ago now, I had a couple of sessions at the beginning where I basically told the players, I'm trying to figure this out. I'd like to have you guys come in and kind of play test these procedures that I've been working on to see how well they work. And uh, the first couple of sessions, things were a little bit rough. I didn't have the procedures worked out. I hadn't mastered them yet. The actual sequence in which I was resolving die rolls was not the right sequence. I wasn't asking for information in the right points. It was very rough. And I had a couple of players who came to that game and told me this sucks and I'm never coming back again. And this is something that happens actually quite a bit when you're playtesting material, surprisingly. Even when you're very clear, hey, this is a playtest session. We're coming in. We're going to be experimenting. The game has not been perfected yet. We are going to be part of the process of making this a better game. There will be players who just don't grok that at a fundamental level. They don't understand that at a fundamental level. And they'll have a bad experience because playtesting often produces bad experiences because playtesting is about finding those bad experiences so that you can eliminate them and they won't want to come back. And that's okay. Those players aren't necessarily the best ones for playtesting material. Cool purple worm art. I love. I actually love this piece of purple worm art. The, the tunnel going really far back as the tail recedes away is actually, by the standards of other art in 1974 OD&D, actually a really nice piece. I am actually also just a real sucker for, for depth in image, even relatively simplistic drawings like this. And here's an example. On the next page, we have an example of the bandits being rolled up as well. So assume 183 bandits are encountered. There will be the following supernormal types with them. So one thing I actually find interesting is that dice notation was not had not been standardized and was not really well presented at this point yet. And so often you'll run into this problem where, for example, there are 30 to 300 men. But what do you actually roll to generate that number? There are a lot of possibilities. The most likely, like I said, is probably 1d10 times 30. But I say that's the most likely possibility. But here on the next page, we see that assume 183 bandits are encountered. Well, I don't know how to generate 183 bandits other than maybe just rolling 3d100. But if you roll 3d100, 30 wouldn't be the base value. So anyways, I don't know how he was rolling 30 to 300. I don't, know, I don't know how they were generating that. There will be the following super normal types with them. Six fighting men of fourth level, three fighting men of fifth or sixth level, and one fighting man of the eighth or ninth level. And again, that all flows directly out of the initial information there. Then using percentile dice, a score of 20% or less would indicate that the fourth level fighter had magical armor, shield, and or sword. Check for each fighter by category. A roll of 25% or 30% or less would indicate the same for the fifth or sixth level fighters. And a score of 40% or 50% or less would indicate the same for the eighth or ninth level fighter. And now here was one of the rare examples where we see individual stats being broken out separately because men are assumed to have AC and other stats based on the equipment that they're wearing. And so armor class and movement in inches is determined by the composition of force and the hit dice is one die per man. And so here again, we kind of see there's some lingering war game stuff. One die per man only makes sense in the context of large scale war gaming resolution. Doesn't mean anything in the context of what we understand to be a role playing game. So looking at composition of force for the bandits, we see that light foot equals 40%, short bow, leather armor, or light crossbow, the same at 25%. Some light horse equals 25%. Medium horse, chainmail and shield, no horse barding equals 10%. All super normal individuals with the force will be riding heavy barded horses. Again, this is one of those things where there's, I think there's two interpretations possible with this text. The one that I'm assuming is true immediately off the bat is that this is actually the breakdown of the force. If you have 100 people in the bandit force, then 40% of them will be light foot, 25% will have light cross, uh, short bows or light crossbows, etc. But there's also the possibility that this is a description of this bandit group's total force composition, and then you'd roll, you'd roll once on the percentile dice, and depending how you rolled, you'd either have a group of entirely light foot bandits or a group of entirely medium horse bandits. My guess is the first one's the, the way that is intended. But again, it's one of those passages that because it's not well spelled out, you can kind of go different ways there as well. All right. And then we can kind of go through here now that we've taken a peek at uh, bandits. We can see that we have berserkers. Berserkers are simply men mad with battle lust. They will have only fighting men with them as explained in the paragraphs above regarding bandits. They never check morale. When fighting normal men, they add plus two to their dice score when rolling due to their ferocity. They all wear leather armor. They have all the same movements and so forth. There's no composition of force here. Brigands are the same as bandits except plus one morale and they are chaos in alignment. 
Did we actually get an alignment on bandits? I don't remember getting an alignment on bandits. By process of elimination, again, there's two possibilities. Are bandits the lawful brigands? Or uh, are bandits of all alignments, but brigands are always chaos? Again, there's a lot of interesting sort of areas of gray within the imprecision of the Gagaxian prose here. Dervishes. Dervishes are fanatically religious nomads who fight as berserkers, never checking morale with plus one on hit dice and otherwise as nomads below, except they will always be led by an eighth to tenth level cleric and are lawful in alignment. Nomads, uh, these raiders of the desert or steppes, are similar to bandits as far as supernormal types and most other characteristics go. And now we get a composition of forces, which is nightly, nicely broken out into a table, which would also have been lovely to have, I think, for the bandits. But most likely we don't, because there wasn't enough space for both on the same page. We have a footnote here for nomads of the desert that says encampments will be guarded by an additional 20 to 40 medium foot with composite bows. And we can see that's because the nomads of the desert and the nomads of the steppes are in fact always mounted with the exception apparently of those camp protectors for the nomads of the desert. Okay, we now have buccaneers. Buccaneers are water-going bandits in all respects, except composition of their forces. You can see that breakdown there. We have pirates, which are the same as buccaneers, except they are aligned with chaos. We see that same that same division there. Again, I mean, perhaps the assumption is that buccaneers are always lawful, which could, I mean, if you, if you assume that that is true and that you were randomly generating what type of force people were meeting, that team-based stuff that we were talking about earlier would, would strongly come into play. Although it's difficult for me to imagine, although maybe, buccaneers saying, oh, hey, um, you guys are lawful, so we're going to let your ship go. If we again think about those teams as not only being an ideological basis, but also a political alliance basis within the metaphysics of this, this very early D&D &D universe, then perhaps that does make sense, because then you could think of buccaneers and pirates as almost being privateers working for one team or the other. And obviously, if you're the privateers of law, you're not going to ransack the vessels of people on your team. We then have cavemen. So cavemen fight as second level fighting men armed with weapons equal to morning stars. And they have no armor but get two hit dice. They have negative one morale. Alignment is always neutrality. And so next up we have here is uh, mermen who are actually categorized as a form of men. So mermen often get overlooked because if we go back to the table here, you'll see that mermen aren't actually broken out. None of these are. The bandits, the dervishes, the nomads of the steppes and all that. None of those are broken out on the table. And so mermen are here in the book, but oftentimes people end up missing the fact that they are in fact part of OD&D. &D. You can actually find a number of people talking about the first appearance of merpeople in D&D &D happening later. But they're here. They're right there. And you can see that they are similar to berserkers. Fight negative one on land. They are armed with tridents and darts, 50-50, one or the other. And the armor class is equal to leather armor. Which has the interesting implication that perhaps they don't need to... They are, that they aren't actually wearing armor. That mer people just have uh, very thick scales. Skin? Scales? Yeah. We can see the early topography of D&D &D rearing its head here. So all of these previous ones were all part of the men. We now hit goblins, but goblins actually are a separate category on the main table, split up with kobolds who also appear as an entry here. All right, so taking a look at goblins, these small monsters are as described in chainmail. They see well in darkness or dim light, but when they are subjected to full daylight, they subtract negative one from their attack and morale dice. They attack dwarves on sight. Their hit dice must always equal at least one pip. The passage about the attack dwarves on site is an interesting example of how rules and flavor text can blend together in a role-playing game. And in this case, something that would be very much flavor text in later editions is very much a rule here. One of the things we looked at back in the first book was the fact that there are morale rules, reaction rules rather, there was also morale rules, but the reaction rules I'm thinking about. That there actually are reaction rules. This is in the first book. There's also some stuff in the third book about that that we'll get to. That determines whether or not people you meet in the dungeon or in the wilderness are anywhere from immediately attacking you to hostile to friendly when they first encounter you. And what this is saying here, when they say they attack dwarves on sight, they are saying that if you have a dwarf in the party, skip the reaction roll. They will automatically be an attack on sight enemy. So this is very much a mechanical thing within the total structure of the OD&D &D rules. Next up, we have a composition of force, just like we did with people. Here we have, when in their lair, the Goblin King will be found. He will fight as a hobgoblin in all respects. He will be surrounded by a body of from 5 to 30. Roll five six-sided dice guards as hobgoblins as well. Early example of reskinning monsters. You can treat some of your goblins as hobgoblins, which will be coming up 
a bit later. Next up we have Kobolds. You can treat these monsters as if they were goblins, except they will take from one to three hits. Roll a six-sided die with a one or two equaling one hit, a three or four equaling two hits, etc. We can again see the early discomfort with dice notation as he needs to explain to the reader how to roll a 1d3 or a 1 to 3. Uh, after goblins and kobolds, we hit orcs. So if we go back just real quick to the, the table at the beginning, we can see that goblins and kobolds are one thing on this table. Orcs get their own line, and hobgoblins and gnolls get a line as well, being grouped together. So those are the distinctions we're looking at here. So we're looking now at orcs, and the number of different tribes of orcs can be varied as desired, basing the decision on token or random chance. Once decided upon, simply generate a random number whenever orcs are encountered. The number generated telling which tribe they belong to, keeping in mind intertribal hostility. When found in their lair, it will be either a cave complex on a 1 to 4 or a village on a 5 to 6. The cave complex will be guarded by sentries. A village will be protected by a ditch and palisade defense, one light catapult per 50 orcs, and a high central tower of some kind. Orcs found in a cave will possibly have strong leader protector types, as will those in villages. That sentence always cracks me up. Here's the thing about one specific one, but it actually applies to both of them. And you can see the breakdown of forces here. It is distinct here on the table of how powerful you can get. You got potentials of balrogs and dragons supporting them as well. One of the things that pops out here, if you've studied some of the lore of, of these early days of D&D, is this idea of the number of different tribes of orcs. This was something that was very important to Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign in a way that has not necessarily been passed down through the years. Several years after D&D came out, Dave Arneson published through Judges Guild a book called The First Fantasy Campaign, which more or less shared some of his notes, his campaign notes, from his old Blackmore game. One of the things he talks about in there is that he had seeded the dungeons of Blackmoor with many different tribes of orcs. An idea here which is traced to Tolkien specifically. In the Lord of the Rings there are several different tribes of orcs that the orcs belong to and it's an interesting example of faction-based play because those orcs in Tolkien would have strife with each other. So long story short he had a number of different orcish tribes down in the depths of his dungeon, and that was a major part of the lore of early Blackmore, and so you can see the emphasis of that carrying all the way through into this text here. Orcs will defend their lair without morale checks until they are numbered three to one. If found other than in their lair, orcs may be escorting a wagon train of from one to eight wagons. There is a 50% chance of this. Each wagon will be carrying from 200 to 1200 gold pieces. Wagon trains will have additional orcs guarding them, 10 per wagon, and be led by either a fighting man or magic user. 50% chance of either. So the fighting man is a role of one is champion, two to four is superhero, and five or six is a lord. This is because D&D originally used uh, level titles. If you go in here to the level table for the different classes, you can see that in fact in, in the original printing they didn't even have numbers next to the levels. It just had the different names for each level. So the first level character is a veteran, then a warrior, and a swordsman. So when this is talking about a champion, they are talking about a seventh level an 8th level or a ninth level or 10th level lord there. The other thing to note about that too is as we begin looking at these composition of forces as used for these outdoor encounters, we can see how powerful these leader types were and how obviously your interaction with these large goblin forces, if you were going to go attack their lairs or their villages, you would not be able to do that as low level adventures. You would need to get to those middle tier levels and probably have a small armed force yourself as we talk about those tiers of play again. Small adventuring bands hiring more hirelings and men at arms to mount larger expeditions against goblin strongholds to get larger payouts to earn the money to build your baronies and your keeps later down there uh, along the line. Note that if orcs are encountered in an area which is part of a regular campaign map, their location and tribe affiliation should be recorded and other orcs located in the same general area will be of the same tribe. Orcs do not like full daylight reacting as do goblins. They attack orcs of different tribes on site unless they are under command of a stronger monster and can score better than 50% on an obedience check. Four to six with a six-headed die for example. This is an example of Gygaxian prose at its worst in terms of explaining rules. Orcs do not like full daylight reacting as goblins. You could just tell me what that rule is but you're gonna make me 
flip back to the goblin page and find that roll, which is just negative one on their attack and morale dice, which takes up basically the exact same length of text as reacting as do goblins. You could have just dropped it right in there for me. And here we can see the strife between the tribes. When I mentioned we were going to do the read through here, and we we're going to be continuing on into volume two, which is the monster book. Some people said, why is it, is it worthwhile to read through all the monster book? And I think there's a lot of fascinating stuff about the early evolution of the mechanics and the world of D&D to be found in the monster listings. This is probably true to some degree in all editions, but you can see again that that deep lore about the, the orc tribes being hostile to each other is here. But this also begins informing a style of play in which between this and the reaction roles, there is an implied setting that if you follow sort of the totality of the guidelines and rules in od and it's a heavenly factionalized world out there with those factions being hostile, not just against the PCs, but also against each other, creating the possibility and opportunity to, for example, form alliances with one group of orcs against another. Moving on here to hobgoblins. These monsters are large and fearless goblins, having plus one morale. The hobgoblin king will fight as an ogre, as will his bodyguard of from one to four in number. Next up, we have the gnolls, which are a cross between gnomes and trolls. Perhaps Lord Dunstein did not really make it all that clear with plus two morale. Otherwise, they are similar to hobgoblins, although the gnoll king and his bodyguard up from one to four will fight as trolls, but lack regenerative power. That is a heck of a description of, of gnolls, as, as someone mentioned in chat that is now scrolled off my screen. A cross between gnomes and trolls. That definitely comes conjures up a, a unique picture of gnolls, which is definitely not what pops into mind these days. The other thing, of course, we, we see here is a reference to Lord Dunsany. We've seen references to Tolkien as well, of course, and we can really begin seeing the sort of kitchen sink nature of early D&D in this book in particular, the Monsters and Treasure book, as we look at elements from different fantasy stories all being poured into a single universe, into a single kitchen sink fantasy world for the dungeon master and the players to explore together. But next up we do have ogres. And so these large and fearsome monsters range from 7 to 10 feet in height and due to their size will score one die plus two three to eight points of hits when they hit. When encountered outside their lair they will carry from 100 to 600 gold pieces. Quite often rules would be implied through examples in these books. And you have to use some caution because sometimes contradictions are just contradictions. But if we look at this ogre rule here, when they say when encountered outside their lair, they will cut carry from 100 to 600 gold pieces each. But if we go back to the table and we look at the ogre type or amount of treasure column, we can see that ogres carry, or ogres have a type of 1,000 gold pieces plus a roll on the type suite treasure table. This might just be a contradiction, but generally speaking, once you actually start diving into this, what you'll discover is that type or amount of treasure is actually supposed to be inside the lairs. The wandering monsters would generally, would not be assumed to be carrying around large amounts of gold. And that comes back to this, the fact that XP was treasure and wandering monsters were a cost. Now, if the wandering monsters were all bringing the treasure and the experience points to you, which is what they do in modern D&D, for better or for worse, then wandering monsters are not really a punishment. They are a lovely reward tweet which shows up on the regular for you. Kind of a delivery service for experience points. And so the assumption back here, though, is that you have to actually go work for it. You have to find some way of penetrating the lair, getting the treasure out, preferably we'll maybe not fighting all 300 of the goblins, and get the treasure that way. And here we can see, so with the, the ogres here, they actually do carry some XP slash gold pieces on the hoof, and we kind of saw that a little bit too with the goblin wagons, that when the goblin wagons are out and about, we have XP in them, their wagons, as we said. So next up we have trolls. Oh, so Harlequin81 mentions that they suddenly realized that this, he's never seen the first printing before, is the first confirmation that they've seen that D&D gnolls are based on Lord Dunsany's gnolls. And Dunsany's gnolls were spelled G-N-O-L-E-S. When the Tolkien estate sued TSR and forced them to take out all the token references to hobbits and ents and so forth, which became replaced with halflings and treants and other things not trademarked by the token estate. They also preemptively went in and began clearing out other references. And I, and I, I think you're right that this Lord Dunsany, this explicit Lord Dunsany reference was also something that got, that got the axe uh, during that cleanup. 
And so uh, we talked about gnolls being drawn from Lord Dunsany. Now we're going to be looking at trolls, and D&D trolls are, taking from, are taken from Paul Anderson. These thin, rubbery, green-skinned trolls with regeneration are taken straight out of Paul Anderson's books. Thin and rubbery, loathsome trolls are able to regenerate. So that beginning the third melee round after one is hit, it will begin to repair itself. Regeneration is at the rate of three hit points per turn. Even totally sundered trolls will regenerate eventually, so that unless they are burned or immersed in acid, they will resume combat when they have regenerated to six or more hit points. In strength, they are about equal to an ogre, but as they use only their talons and fangs for weapons, only one die of damage is scored when they hit an opponent. One of the cool things about trolls, and I think this is you know, pretty well understood, but here we have, we have a really cool example of how important memorable special abilities are in terms of creating different combat challenges. Trolls give you something unique that ogres don't, although they are otherwise very much stat block based. And part of what was happening in these early days of D&D &D in particular, when the... Because we talk about the kitchen sink, we talk about all the things that got poured into D&D &D in these early days. And one of the things about that kitchen sink is that before the kitchen sink started filling up, there was a, a limited amount of things that were actually, you know, available to the dungeon master. These days we are inundated with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different creatures, not just in Dungeons and Dragons, but across all forms of media. Every new video game role playing the game that comes out introduces dozens of new creature types. But back in 1974, if we can if we can throw our minds back there, there is a relative paucity of, of of fantasy creatures like this and the other thing about about that paucity is also that generally speaking people didn't think about creatures in this way with labels and specific stat blocks and properties this is also something that is emerging as a result of dungeon and dragons in this time frame and you have to some extent read these early stat blocks in that context, that they are almost like naturalists attempting to categorize and describe in mechanically actionable ways these creatures and monsters, which frequently in the source material would just be creatures and monsters. Giants. As stated in Chainmail, giants act as mobile light catapults with a 20-foot range. Due to their huge weapons, all giants will score two dice of damage when hitting an opponent. Wandering giants will carry from 1,000 to 6,000 gold pieces with them in their usual copious shoulder sack. A note that there can be many types of giants, including the following. And then we have our very first breakdown of the Hillstone, Frostfire, and Cloud Giants, which of course have become the absolute staples of D&D &D giantdom across all editions. But as in, all, as in, as in, in the case of all editions, uh, we can see that each category is slightly more difficult as their hit dices advance. We can see this distinction of what type of lair it is. Again, emphasizing that whether you were rolling these as at the table as PCs were exploring ahead, or if you were prepping hexes for your hex crawl ahead of time, that as you were generating these encounters, you would also be generating their layers and populating those layers accordingly. See their approximate size there as well. We can see that this actually, so as the state in Chainmail, giants act as mobile light catapults. Kill giants are what that describes. Stone giants get to throw as a heavy catapult. As we move up here, frost giants are impervious to cold and do extra damage. Fire giants are impervious to fire and do even more damage. Cloud Giants have a keen sense of smell, which is really interesting, uh, and do three dice of hit damage. Why do Cloud Giants have a keen sense of smell? Well, because, of course, they are taken from Jack and the Beanstalk. Fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. We see Hill Giants are the most common, 60% chance, while the others are seldom encountered, 10% of to each type, total 40%. You have a table right there just put the numbers on the table gygax those giants who abide in castles sometimes have additional guards there is a 50 percent chance that some other monster will be there on a one to four there is a hydra of from five to ten heads on a die of five or six there is either from six to 36 wolves or from three to 18 bears those are really interesting numbers because if you end up looking at the early g series modules which were the giant modules g1 has a whole bunch of wolves in their in their castle and you can see very much how that adventure uh, very much it falls in line with the implied setting and guidelines of uh of this section and now as drow 007 says we move on to the undead starting with the skeletons and the zombies 
So skeletons and zombies act only under the instructions of their motivator, be it a magic user or cleric of chaos. They are usually only found near graveyards, forsaken places, and dungeons. But there is a possibility of their being located elsewhere to guard some item, referee's option. There is never any morale check for these monsters. They will always attack until totally wiped out. I think that goes pretty straightforward there in terms of, of how those work. Uh, although there can be a little bit, again, like I talked about, casting our minds back to 1974 and even just the the strict act of dividing types of undead into different into different categories like this and then applying a definitive label to them is is not necessarily something that happened prior to D&D or or rarely happened prior to D&D. Uh, if you read stories before D&D, uh, you'll often discover that the same undead creatures are described as being zombies and ghouls and whites and so forth, kind of all at the same time. This idea of these different these different categories being very specific is again uh, very much something that evolves out of needing to categorize things in order to be able to bring them mechanically to the game table. As we take a look at ghouls, as stated in Chainmail for Whites, ghouls paralyze any normal figure they touch, excluding elves. They otherwise melee in the regular fashion and are subject to missile fire. Any man type killed by a ghoul becomes one. So very little in the way of a description there of exactly what a ghoul is, but we get a pretty good sense that there's some form of undead, maybe. Although, I mean, that's all, to some extent, that's only clear to us today because we know that ghouls would become undead. And yes, they are in this section of, they are in this section of the list that appears to be filled with other undead entities. So it's a logical conclusion. But if you read that entry all by itself, you might not come to that conclusion. And in fact, if you read H.P. Lovecraft's Dreamlands book, his ghouls are not clearly corpses. They are, ghouls are actually either human creatures or human, human-esque creatures that feast on human flesh. So... Next up, we have Whites, which are Barrow Whites, as per token, which are nasty critters who drain away life energy levels when they score a hit in melee, one level per hit. Thus, a hit removes both the hit die and the corresponding energy to fight, i.e. a ninth level fighter would drop to 8th level. Whites cannot be affected by normal missile fire, but silver-tipped arrows will score normal damage, and magic arrows will score double hits upon them. Magical weapons will score full hits upon them, and those with a special bonus add the amount of the bonus and hit points to the hits scored. Min types killed by white become whites. An opponent who is totally drained of life energy by a white becomes a white. Obviously here we have classic level drain from which the assumption here actually based on the other books is that you would get a saving throw against that effect. But if you failed, you just lost that level and it was not coming back until you regained the XP to do so. Metacatalepsy had mentioned that they had never connected D&D whites to bearer whites. One of the reasons why that connection got broken is I'm pretty sure the token estate lawsuit here because they can say per token and they can say barrow white the connection between the two of them is very clear but I'm pretty sure if we bounce back into the later post token printing you can see that the description of the white has changed and now they are just nasty critters who drain away life energy when they score a hit in melee one level per hit and because you've you've lost the reference to barrow whites and you've lost the reference to token they are now free to float a little free and go find other definitions, which is what happens over the course of, of the next few years of D&D. After whites, we have wraiths. These monsters are simply high-class whites with more mobility, hit dice, and treasure. Hits by silver-tipped arrows will score only half die of damage, and magic arrows only score one die of damage when they hit. So here in OD&D, wraiths are, in fact, very much token-esque wraiths. These are, these are the nine ring wraiths, with whites being a, a lesser form of the same creature. Mummies. Mummies do not drain life energy as whites and wraiths do, but instead their touch causes a rotting disease which makes wounds take ten times the usual time for healing. A cleric can reduce this to only twice as long with a cured disease spell if administered within an hour. Only magic weapon we will hit mummies, and all hits and bonuses are at one half value against them. Note, however, that mummies are vulnerable to fire, including the ordinary kinds such as a torch. As much as level drain was nasty, I find that the actual original version of mummy rot was considerably less nasty than it was in most editions thereafter. 
Spectres. These monsters have no corporeal body, which makes them totally impervious to all normal weaponry, but can be struck by all magical weapons, including silver-tipped arrows. The Nazgul of Tolkien now fall into this category rather than his wraiths, as stated in Chainmail. My apologies. Apparently Spectres are even more powerful. They drain two life energy levels when they score a hit, and min types killed by Spectres become Spectres under the control of the one who made them. We can see that the actual distinction that happens here in OD&D is that wraiths are actually still physical entities like whites, and specters are specifically spun off to become the first, and in OD&D, I believe, only non-corporeal undead to model the ring wraiths specifically. All right, here we have the last of the undead in this section, uh, which are the vampires. These monsters are properly of the undead class rather than lycanthropes. This is actually the perfect example of understanding the perceptual shift which is happening with with D, &D itself D, D is changing the way we think about fantasy worlds and it is this sentence these monsters vampires are properly of the undead class rather than lycanthropes the idea that monsters could belong to the undead class which would be defined specifically as those monsters which can be turned by clerics because that's the only reason you need to have that class is because clerics have the ability to turn undead monsters and we have defined what undead monsters are they are skeletons zombies ghouls whites wraiths mummies specters and vampires in order to interface with those mechanics that's the first thing and then the second thing and it's actually when i first read od and d i was thrown off because they said these monsters are properly of the undead class rather than lycanthropes and i thought to myself why would you say that of course vampires aren't lycanthropes but then i was like well, that's not obvious at all, actually, unless you're dealing in the paradigm that D&D &D creates with this sentence. Because vampires in the traditional literature, including Bram Stoker's Dracula, can turn into wolves. And if you can turn into a wolf from a human form, you could easily be categorized as a lycanthrope. And in fact, in many pre-D&D gothic horror fictions involving vampires, they would be described as a form of lycanthrope. And so it's only post D&D saying, well, we have to have the vampire be in one category. There's an undead class and there is a lycanthrope class that you actually do see that division, which of course eventually leads to Stephanie Meyer having team vampire versus team lycanthrope, team Edward versus team Jacob. And what I'm saying 100% here is that Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax are completely responsible for the Twilight novels. I'm just saying. Okay, uh, back to the vampires here. If the vampires are exposed to direct rays of sunlight, immersed in running water, or impaled through the heart with a wooden stake, they are killed. Otherwise, they can be hit only as specters, but such hits do not kill them, but only force them to assume gaseous form if they lose all hit points. Vampires drain two life energy levels as do specters when they hit an opponent in combat. They regenerate during combat as do trolls, but they do so immediately upon being hit at the rate of three hit points per turn. Vampires can command help by calling to them from 10 to 100 rats or bats, or from 3 to 18 wolves. They can polymorph themselves into either a huge bat or into a gaseous form, doing either at will. They charm min types merely by looking into their eyes, treat as a charm person spell with a minus two for the object's saving throw against magic. Vampires can abide the smell of garlic, the face of a mirror, or the sight of a cross, which is of course why those objects appear on the equipment list in volume one. They will fall back from these as strongly presented. They must always return to a coffin whose bottom is covered with soil from their native land during the daylight hours. Min types killed by vampires become vampires under the control of the one who made them. The notable difference there being that control aspect. We've seen a number of these creatures who can cause their victims to rise as them, but only the vampires create vampires who are under their control. 